Hello, and welcome to the Analytical Services Lab at the Complex Carbohydrate Research Center in Athens, Georgia. My name is John, and I am a research technician here. Today, we will be going through the procedure for glycosyl linkage analysis with partially methylated aldotol acetates, or PMAAs. This method allows us to break down oligosaccharides and polysaccharides into monosaccharides and determine how they were linked in their original structures. Through this method, we are able to detect pyranose and furanose forms of sugars, which are indistinguishable through other methods of glycosyl composition. We are unable to observe uronic acids and amino sugars without certain changes to the method, which will be discussed later. This method involves four steps. The first step is methylation. This step replaces hydroxide groups with O-methyl groups, leaving the linkages between sugars intact. Second, the hydrolysis. We use 2-molar trifluoroacetic acid, or TFA, to break the bonds between sugars, leaving a hydroxide group where the linkages were. The third step is reduction. We use a high concentration of sodium borodeuteride in basic condition to open the sugar chains and add a deuterium to the carbon one of each monosaccharide. The last step is acetylation. This step replaces the hydroxide groups with acetyl groups. This does not affect the O-methyl groups, which allows us to see the original linkages on the GCMS. Before we start the experiment, remember to follow lab safety guidelines and always wear gloves, lab coat, and eye protection. For the methylation step, we prepare a base using sodium hydroxide in DMSO. This is a strong base able to ionize carbohydrate hydroxyl groups, allowing them to react with methyl iodide to form stable methyl ethers. For the first step of this experiment, we'll start by demonstrating the preparation of this base. First, we take 100 microliters of 50% weight by weight sodium hydroxide and add 200 microliters of methanol and vortex for three to five seconds. Next, we add two milliliters of DMSO, vortex for five seconds, and centrifuge for 30 seconds to pellet the base. Here we have the base pelleted at the bottom of the tube. It is more opaque than the DMSO top layer. We then pipe it out the top DMSO layer and rinse the walls of the tube and discard that top layer. We then repeat that process by adding two more milliliters of DMSO, vortexing, centrifuging, and removing that DMSO layer while washing the walls of the tube. We do this until the DMSO layer removed is clear. After the final wash, we add two milliliters of DMSO to the base solution and vortex this solution, and the base is now ready to be added to the sample. Before we add our sodium hydroxide base to the sample, the sample is dissolved in 400 microliters of DMSO. This is spun magnetically using spin vanes, which should sit for at least 30 minutes prior to beginning the experiment. The sample can spin for longer though, even a week before beginning to really try to dissolve the sample as much as possible. We add 400 microliters of our base into our sample and sonicate the sample for 15 to 30 minutes. The sonication is to help insolubles and magnetically spinning is okay. After sonicating, we add 100 microliters of iodomethane to the sample and allow the sample to spin magnetically for 40 minutes. This concludes one round of methylation. To try to ensure complete methylation, a second round of base and iodomethane addition is effective. A second methylation is not necessary in some cases, such as oligosaccharides. 400 microliters of our base is added again and allowed to sonicate for 30 minutes, followed by another 100 microliter addition of iodomethane and a 40 minute spin. Now, to neutralize the iodomethane, we add two milliliters of water, which will turn the sample cloudy. And to remove the iodomethane, we evaporate it out by streaming nitrogen gas through the sample using our blowers by placing the pipette at the bottom of the tube. The iodomethane has completely evaporated off and the sample turns back to a clear solution, which should take about 20 seconds. The sample may not become clear if something else is in the solution, in which it is okay to continue. Next, 
2 milliliters of dichloromethane, or DCM, is added to the solution and the sample is vortex and centrifuge. Centrifugation should be between 30 seconds to 1 minute. The top water layer is removed, washing the sample. This wash is repeated with two more milliliters of water added to the sample and once again vortex and centrifuge removing the water layer. This is in order to remove all the DMSO from the sample. This is repeated a total of five times and finally the DCM layer is transferred to another tube to be dried down under nitrogen stream fully. Now for the hydrolysis step, we add 400 microliters of 2 molar TFA to our dried down sample. This is placed on a 121 degrees Celsius heating block for two hours. After two hours on the heating block, the sample is removed and dried down under nitrogen stream. 400 microliters of isopropanol is added to the sample and dried down two separate times to ensure all the acid is removed. It is important to ensure the sample is dried down and the acid is removed because the next step, which is a reduction, requires basic conditions. For reduction, we prepare a 10 milligram per milliliter solution of sodium borodeuteride and 100 millimolar ammonium hydroxide. 400 microliters of this solution is added to the sample. The sample is lightly vortexed and allowed to incubate at room temperature for three hours, but can also go overnight. After incubating at room temperature, the sample is neutralized with five drops of acetic acid and five drops of methanol and dried down under nitrogen stream. Once dried, 400 microliters of a 9 to 1 ratio of methanol to acetic acid is added to the sample and dried down two separate times. Finally, 400 microliters of methanol is added to the sample and dried down. This is repeated until there is a white salty crust around the side of the tubes. The salt may result in a syrup which is hard to completely dry, so it is okay to continue to extraction if this occurs. Now for our final step, the acetylation. 250 microliters of acetic anhydride is added to the sample tube, followed by 250 microliters of concentrated TFA. The sample is incubated at 45 degrees Celsius for 25 minutes. After incubation, the sample is allowed to cool to room temperature and one milliliter of isopropanol is added. The sample is dried down completely which takes about 30 minutes. After the sample is dried, two milliliters of water is added to the sample and the sample is vortexed. Then, two milliliters of DCM is added to the sample and the sample is vortexed thoroughly and centrifuged. Then the top water layer is removed, washing the sample. This process is repeated again and up to three or four times with two milliliters of water added, vortex, centrifuged, and the water layer removed. On the final wash, the DCM layer is transferred to another tube to be dried down. After the sample has dried down, it is reconstituted in 150 microliters of DCM, transferred to a GC vial, and then injected into a GCMS for analysis.
Now, we'll be looking at an example GC chromatogram and going over how to identify peaks that are obtained by the GCMS. Here, we have an example of the partially methylated adital acetate residues, or PMAA residues, detected by the GCMS in a sample. We have already identified the glycosyl linkage residues in this chromatogram. The first step towards identifying peaks in a linkage GC chromatogram is to know the order at which PMAA residues pollute. Here we have an example of a sort of database we've collected of retention times for linkage residues we've observed over time using the conditions you see in the table. Using the SP2330 column, the order which these linkage residues pollute are fixed, though their retention times may change between runs. You may see a residue which has an early retention time listed after a later looting residue in the table. This is due to not updating that retention time because that residue is uncommon. The second step to identifying peaks is to verify the mass spectrum and confirm the identity of the PMAA residue. Going to our sample GC linkage chromatogram example, we'll be looking to verify the identity of the peak at 17.865 minutes or our four linked glucoperanosyl linkage residue. We have the mass spectrum for this peak shown with a major 118 and 233 mass to charge ratio values. A valuable resource is the link shown on the screen right now, which will take you to the CCRC website where we have a PMAA database. On this website, we can hover over and look at the four linked glucopuranocell residue and see the common fragmentations. We can see that the residue has similar fragments as the one observed in our mass spectrum. We can also click on that button to get an example of a spectrum. Here, we show the fragmentation for terminal and other single linked glucopuranocell PMAA residues taken off the CCRC database. The trend for the most common fragmentation is that the ionization occurs between two O-methyl groups more favorably than O-methyl and O-acetyl groups or two O-acetyl groups. Now, let's discuss some changes to the linkage procedure that are necessary to identify amino sugar linkage residues and uronic acid linkage residues. Let's begin with amino sugars. For amino sugars such as N-acetylglucosamine and N-acetylgalactosamine, the acetylation step is changed. The typical acidic conditions do not result in a complete acetylation of the sample, and instead would result in some positively charged amino groups, which will be polar and unable to enter the GC column. This would result in an incomplete representation of the amino sugar linkages in the results, so we must use basic conditions. For the basic condition acetylation, 250 microliters of acetic anhydride and 250 microliters of pyridine is used. The hydroxyl groups are less efficiently acetylated, so the samples are heated at a higher temperature at 100 degrees Celsius and left for an hour versus the neutral sugar procedure which heats at 45 degrees Celsius for 25 minutes. To observe the amino sugar PMAA residues, we use a separate Supelco Equity 1 column. On the right, we have an example of a linkage GC chromatogram on top of a mass spectrum for a terminal N-acetylgalactosamine. Similar to identifying neutral sugars, we can use the CCRC PMAA database to look at fragmentation and match mass to charge ratio values to identify our peaks. Now, let's discuss how to perform linkage analysis to observe uronic acid linkage residues. Prior to the methylation discussed in the standard neutral sugar linkage procedure, the sample undergoes a methanolysis and reduction. A mild condition methanolysis esterifies the carboxylic acid into a methyl ester. This activates the carboxylic group to be reduced to a hydroxide group with two deutero groups, replacing the double bond to one of the oxygens. Nothing would occur if the uronic acid itself were to be reduced, so creating a methyl ester is necessary for this reaction. The reduction does not need to occur in basic conditions as well, 
So water is sufficient for dissolving the sodium borodeuteride to create the reduction solution. Thin reducing sugars or polysaccharides labile to mild acidic conditions of methanolysis. The carbon-1 bond may become methylated. The reduction step does not cause a ring opening as it does in the neutral sugar linkage procedure due to the methyl group on the carbon-1. The later 2-molar TFA hydrolysis step will remove this methylation of the carbon-1, which allows for the basic reduction to occur. Now, let's take a look at an example of how uronic acids look in the GCMS data. Here, we have an example of a GC chromatogram on top of a mass spectrum for a sample which has undergone the uronic acid linkage procedure. We'll be looking at the four-linked galactopyranose residue and the four-linked galactopyranose uronic acid residue. The mass spectrum for the four-linked galactopyranose residue from the CCRC PMAAA database is shown on the left, as well as the typical fragmentation. And it shows two major mass to charge values of 118 and 233. Because the first reduction causes the carbon-6 to have two deuteral groups rather than hydrogen groups, there will be a mass to charge increase of two for the fragment representing the bottom half of the sugar. This causes the 233 mass to charge ratio value to become 235, which is what we see in the mass spectrum. When integrating this peak in enhanced data analysis, that integration will have both the neutral sugar and the uronic acid. The extract ion chromatogram function is required to determine how much of that area corresponds to the neutral sugar or the uronic acid.